Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash new music industry. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. So today I'm chatting with music educator and author, Wendy Brent Wood. How are you today, Wendy? I'm great, thank you, despite being blown about by the wind today. Oh, is it quite windy in, in Australia? Yeah, it's still winter, so it's cold and windy today. Oh, uh, okay. We're smack dab in the middle of summer, so it's obviously an opposite. You have 40 years of experience in developing and running music schools. As a guitar teacher of over 10 years myself, I have a great deal of respect and interest in anyone that's committed to music education. So tell us about your passion. <laughs> well, I was one of those kids who could never leave a musical instrument alone. So I was being forever given instruments by my grandparents or borrowing them from friends or whatever and just learning every instrument I could get my hands on at school. So it was pretty uh, unexpected, no, <laughs> very much expected that I went into studying music education uh, and then became a classroom teacher as well as instrumental teacher. And I just haven't stopped. I'm either uh, writing curriculums or teaching or training teachers and now coaching teachers. It's just something that is such a... Uh, a dear and passionate project because I think it has so much impact in people's lives. Mm. So basically you've gone from teaching your own students to now having teachers as your students. Very much so. I, I do both still, but mm. um, I've been called upon by a number of teachers who obviously seen what I've done over the years and they're wanting help with their own teaching, particularly the business side, uh, because I've done uh, retail studios, I've franchised, I've had school music programs, developed curriculums for different instruments and, and they come to me because they know that I've already done what they're trying to do. So it's really, really great to be able to help others because it's not an easy industry to make a good living from. So do you find that your audience generally is artistically inclined but doesn't necessarily have the business chops to pull it off? Very much so. Mm. And we haven't had a lot of education around the business side of, of being a music teacher in the past. It's starting to develop a little bit more out here in Australia. I don't know what it's like where you are, but some of the university courses um, are including a little bit of the business side, but not very much. Yeah, I would say, you know, as a general observation, I think competition is just becoming more fierce than it ever was here in Calgary. And we don't have that big of a city. I mean, as a city, it's over a million people, but it's still kind of a small place in the middle of nowhere. So for for such a, a remote place, we have tons of people serving this, this niche. Yeah, I would agree entirely. There's a, a lot more people who are willing to follow their passion which, you know, music usually is something people get passionate about as performers, but then they can't sustain a, an income from being a performer and they go into teaching. And so sometimes it's almost like a secondary thing, but they fall in love with teaching. And again, it can be really hard to generate a decent income because it's very much a, an hour by hour type of income and can be very variable. I know it's funny because I ended up teaching for over 10 years and that was never necessarily the goal or the plan. It's just how things came together in my own music career. Having multiple sources of income was certainly important. And oftentimes, even though it wasn't like a huge income, teaching paid more than a lot of other stuff I was doing. Yeah, on an hourly basis, it can do. Um, but it's getting the regularity of it and making it sustainable that is often the difficult part for people. I know one of the most challenging aspects of it for me personally was just turnover. So do you find there's a fairly high turnover rate with students? There can be. Um, again, it depends on a lot of the, the way you structure your teaching. 
and making sure that the students that you're taking on board are actually the right students for you. Because if you just open the doors and say, hey, I teach, let's say it's guitar, I teach guitar, and you take everybody who says they want to learn guitar, then you're going to have turnover of people who aren't a good match for you because maybe they want to do classical guitar and your specialty is, you know, heavy metal. Well, not really a good fit. (laughs) So you might be able to teach them a few basics, but ultimately you're not going to be able to deliver what they want and you're going to be frustrated because they're going to be wanting to do things that you're not comfortable with or you're just not skilled with and don't have confidence and so, you know, the, the relationship is not a strong one to begin with. So if you can start by making sure you know what you're good at to teach and you find the students that match your goals and you can match to their goals, then it comes down to things like good customer service and good communication that helps to retain those students. So you've always got to be looking at both sides of the picture. What works for you in terms of achieving your goals of regular income and timetables and stuff, but also what works for the student? How much flexibility do they need um, rearranging their their lessons? What sort of goals are you setting and and how are you motivating them? Because if you're not motivating them, of course, that won't stay around for very long either. Mm-hmm. So student retention, there's, there's so much to it, but it's such an important part of being a teacher. Yeah. So it's, it's again, it's something that people need educating on. It's not always a natural thing that people understand that they need to do. Do you find that like value added services help things like workshops or recitals or other types of events? I have found in my own music school, particularly in the last five to 10 years that The regularity of performances has been one thing that's made a big difference. Mm. We used to do the the once a year big concert and although that was great and a huge thing to put on, it hasn't had as much impact as having two or three or even four regular concerts a year. So for us in, in Melbourne, we have four school terms. So at the end of every term, we would have a concert And it would mean that for students, they didn't have to come to every single one because they're really busy doing loads of other things, too many other things. Um, But they had the opportunity and they had that goal to work towards as well. And we would often say to them, if you can't come to the concert, that's cool. We're going to prepare something anyway and we'll do a video of you so that mum and dad and gran and rest of the family can see you in, in action anyway so that they'd actually get to perform one way or the other. So that sort of thing is such a big motivation for them. If you can add on things like workshops or school holiday programs, then you're giving variety to your students as well. You can offer them different sorts of topics to do, give them different skills, like uh, you might teach them how to improvise or you might get them together in an ensemble or something like that that they can't do regularly during term. And, again, that can spark such an enthusiastic response from the students that it takes them off on a whole new plane of of learning. So you you can't say that... um, any add-ons that are not going to have value for sure. The one problem, though, that I do find is that kids' parents are really busy these days. Do you find that, that students over in Calgary are overscheduled? <laughs> oh, yeah, it's hilarious. You know, they, they go to the music lessons after school and after the music lessons they have volleyball and after volleyball they have soccer. It just goes on and on. Exactly, exactly, which makes it really hard when we're saying to them, you know, you have to go home and, you know, every day or four times a week you need to go over the stuff we've done in the lesson. You know, it's like well, where do they squeeze that in? So if you then go to the parents or the students and say, hey, here's this extra workshop, you've got to come back on another day and, you know, dedicate time here or there, it's like, oh, I'd love to, but where do I fit it in? So sometimes those extra things are not actually viable So what I've 
done with my music school is start to build it into the lessons a little bit more in a smaller way. So we have things like we have a, a challenge every term. So like I said, we've got four terms in the year. So we'll have a challenge which will be, uh, for example, a really easy one to do uh, where we chart how many new what I call performance pieces that they have memorised this particular term. So we put a chart up on the wall and then we have prizes and, you know, it's just a little um, incentive for them to achieve some stuff. And, and next term it might be something around the improvising um, side of things. And the next term it'll be something totally different. So you can be as creative as you like or you give them something to work towards that's a little bit different, a new skill or a new way of, of uh, thinking about what they're working on and straight away you're motivating them and making them think differently. And often it's the competitive thing that kicks in that they really like. So they like mm. getting prizes. They like seeing themselves go up a leaderboard, particularly if it's visual and it's on the wall and all those sorts of things. Just keep that spark alive for them. They keep it fresh. It keeps it new and it keeps them motivated. So I totally agree. You've got to do some extra things. It should never be same old, same old for every lesson that they walk in for. Mm, absolutely. Now, I'm making a bit of an assumption here, but I think in, in your niche of the industry and having experienced it myself, I, I would imagine that burnout amongst teachers is somewhat of a common thing. I don't know what it was for me. I think it was maybe just spending long hours one-on-one -on -one with people paying attention to every single move they made on their instrument. But, you know, if, if that's the case, how do people cope with that type of burnout? Well, I think the burnout, if I can start by addressing that first, Mm -hmm. is also partly related to the fact that a lot of our teaching has to be done in unsocial hours. So you can, of course, teach in schools and do some teaching in regular sort of school hours during the day, but a lot of us as, as studio teachers have to work after school, evenings, weekends, mm -hmm. and that impacts on not only our, our own hours of work, but it means that our social life and our family life has to be reorganised to work around our teaching hours. So, you know, you're not able to spend that quality time so much. Um, oh, look, I've seen a lot of discussion on, on various social media of how people handle it, but I think it comes back to the, the real basics of lifestyle. Mm. You have to make sure you look after yourself physically and emotionally and, and spiritually, if I can call it that. So getting enough sleep, you know, eating well, making sure you get some exercise, even if it's just a walk around the block, um, all those sorts of things, you know, taking up something like yoga or meditation uh, mm. or mindfulness, you know, looking after all of that, all the different components that make us creative human beings is really important because we end up, giving so much of ourselves as music teachers because we're also counsellors. You know, people come in, they tell us, you know, the woes of the week. Uh, we become their psychologists as well, mm -hmm. trying to help them figure out how to get through things, whether it's, you know, the, uh, the tests and exams at school or whether it's the family dramas or, you know, the relationship issues. They come to us because we're teaching them often one at a time and they become quite close and they they also respect us as individuals because we work so closely with them. And we often, we're spending, you know, such a lot of time with them over months and sometimes years. You know, some students you can have for 10 years and you get to know them quite well. Mm -hmm. So it's very draining but it's also very rewarding you know, to, to have that privilege. So we've got to look after our lifestyle and, and you can burn out. I, I mean, I've been there and done that. And things for me personally is getting enough sleep, uh, eating well, exercising, which can be the walk around the block with the dogs, and meditation. They're just vital parts of keeping myself running. The part where you talked about 
it being during social hours was something that I hadn't even thought about. And and part of that is maybe just the fact that Calgary is not like a super social city. And so there, there are many <laughs> nights I find myself alone, even if that's not my intention. <laughs> but uh, uh, I could see that being a factor, right? Because we all need community. We all need people. We all need that kind of support to to help that's us right. do the things we need to do. So that's a great point. Yeah, look, even for, for people like myself where I've been teaching while I was having a family, you know, I had young children and I was juggling how do I cook their dinner whilst I'm teaching till, you know, six or seven in the evening. And I would do stupid things like I would schedule like one hour to cook the dinner, eat the dinner and then be back at teaching for another two hours. And you do that for a certain amount of time and the pressure just builds up. So you've got to juggle and balance and So I ended up, you know, getting the right equipment for my kitchen and I'd have a slow cooker cooking during the day and the dinner was taken care of. But, again, it's a matter of juggling your lifestyle so that you're not constantly in a pressure situation of rushing from one thing to another. So I know there are plenty of teachers and musicians out there either earning good money on the side or haven't made a career out of teaching. Do you see that there's an upper limit to how much one can earn in teaching and what are some common obstacles teachers can overcome to ensure profitability? Look, there shouldn't be an upper limit other than what you put upon yourself. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think because we've got such a great facility now with technology, in some ways the sky's the limit. So if you're willing to explore alternative ways of teaching, then you can do amazing things. Um, So, and by that I mean a lot of people start out by saying, I only want to teach, you know, their main instrument. So for me that would have been piano. So if I had said, I only want to teach piano because that's what I did in my degree, I took it to the highest level and I'm not going to teach anything else, straight away that put limitations on the number of students I'd accept. And it would have had a whole different uh, outcome with my development of my music school. Whereas I said, look, I've I've got these skills in clarinet and flute and guitar and violin, but I can only teach beginners to a a low intermediate level. But I took on students in that and I kept educating myself. And it meant that I ended up with such a packed schedule that I started to employ teachers. And by employing teachers, I was able to keep on taking on more students. Now, I've also heard people say, oh, but I don't want to employ people. You know, that's too much hassle. Yes, it is a big responsibility. And yes, you've got to learn some extra skills, but it enables you to keep growing that income because Mm -hmm. you're earning a percentage of their lesson fees as well as your own teaching and so forth. And I've heard people say, I don't want more than one location. Well, if you take on a second location, again, you've got more opportunity to take more students and build more income. Individual lessons as against group lessons. So group lessons instantly more per hour in your income than one-on-one students. So there's lots of different ways you can leverage your time so that you are only teaching the same amount of time or you're only administering the same amount of time, but you've got a broader base of students and teachers across the board to generate more income. And with technology these days, we've got teaching online via the Skype type medium, we've got um, YouTube, we've got online sorts of courses, um, even the coaching and things that I'm doing now with teachers themselves. That enables different sorts of income to come into my business, which if I'd sat back and said, no, I'm only going to teach piano and I'm only going to teach individuals, would never have happened. So people have to be open to different sorts of teaching to make the sky the limit if they want to. But having said that, people shouldn't feel obliged either. I think people want to be following their passion. So if they put themselves in an uncomfortable situation and try and teach something they're not comfortable with, they're probably not going to do it well. So they do have to be mindful of 
doing what they want to do, what they're passionate about, or be prepared to learn new skills and, and keep educating themselves if they want to try and go outside that comfort zone. There's nothing wrong with that either. Education is brilliant. <laughs> yeah. As someone who's been in the online business world for a while, like where my mind immediately goes is all those other potential revenue streams like advertising or affiliate marketing or some of the things you mentioned with core courses or maybe a mastermind group or a, or a membership, which I'm sure is, is things people can exploit as well. But, uh, I think, like you said, keeping it simple, having a focus at first before you get too crazy with all these other ideas is probably best. Yeah, we can certainly jump into too many things too quickly. Um, I've also experienced that. I don't know about you, but a lot mm -hmm. of creative people tend to come up with ideas all the time and getting that focus and finishing things off can be a problem. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Grab your creative ideas and store them somewhere so you can come back to them, but make sure you have your priorities in place so that you do go through a step-by-step -step building process and you do actually finish things and achieve some goals rather than spreading yourself so thin, spreading your, your marketing dollars or spreading your time so thin that in the end you don't achieve anything. That's a, a real problem that people do need to be mindful of yeah something i still do to this day is just write things down in a notebook or an evernote or somewhere i may never look there again it's entirely possible yeah. but at least i got the idea out on, out of my head and uh, and somewhere uh where it can live exactly yeah just try and find one place to store it all and then you can occasionally flip back to it Music education is quickly going by the wayside, at least in the school system in many countries. What are your thoughts on this and why do you feel it's important? Look, it's it's a constant sense of disappointment that music is not valued yeah. any way near where it should be. And I find this even just in talking to potential um, parents of students that are making inquiries that sometimes all you get from them is, how much does it cost? And that's all they're interested in. Yep. And it's like, well, it's, you know, it's not just about the money. It's about matching up your child to what they want to do and what, what goals that they want to achieve with the right program, with the right teacher and, and so on. So that's a disappointment to start with. But I actually had a parent recently say how uh, private music teachers are actually – excluding children from the opportunity of learning music because they charge too much. And it's like, wow, now that is a big statement. And I was thinking about mm. that really. It comes down to things like how long do we as musicians and, and music teachers train to get the skills that we, we have as musicians? How long would you reckon you've trained for to become a proficient guitarist david <laughs> uh, i mean i am still in the process <laughs> right i've been playing yeah, exactly. 17 years and i'm still in the process exactly exactly and most of us as musicians are ongoing learners because music you know just goes on you it's constantly reinventing itself but we actually train for for usually decades you know if you go through the exam system the, there's at least eight levels plus then diplomas and so forth. So you've got maybe 10 years to get to that level where you say, well, I've got a performance diploma. There's 10 years just for that. Then you do your four-year teaching degree and so on. Compare that to a doctor. How much do doctors charge, you know, specialist doctors? How much do they charge per hour? How long do they train for? Oh, yeah, people say, yes, doctors have to train for six years. Full stop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe not. They do keep educating. I hope they do anyway. <laughs> Otherwise, Me too. We could be in trouble. <laughs> uh, but, you know, if you compare the two, then musicians, music teachers are as highly educated as scientists, as anyone in the medical profession, as pretty much any other profession. And yet, we get told by people like this parent that we're charging too much. And we're making it hard for students to learn music. So, you know, that that's my first response. 
The second response is that schools, yes, they totally let us down mm. because there's not enough music teachers in the schools who are actually musicians and who are qualified to teach music. Musicians and music teachers are not actually the same thing and, and this is something mm -hmm. that might stir up some angst, I hope not, but you can be a fantastic musician and you can be a shocking music teacher. You can be a fantastic music teacher but you don't have to be the absolute top-ranking performer to be a fantastic music teacher. They are different skills. So I think that we need to make sure that we've got really good music teachers in every, particularly every primary school, you know, the juniors, the kids coming up, even kindergartens, they should have proper music teachers, qualified music teachers, experienced music teachers who can nurture and encourage and motivate and, and give all of our children the musical experiences right from when they're little so it, it's ingrained in them. And I think there's some countries in Europe, um, I think like the, the around the Netherlands and other areas like that where they're starting to do some amazing things, maybe even uh, Germany and so forth, they have a lot of European traditions or, or methodology like the Kudai methodology and the Orb methodology where kids are constantly being encouraged to be creative musically and improvise and uh, compose from a very young age. And that's because their, their school program is built in such a way that they have these specialists in place. In Australia, you know, we're lucky sometimes to have somebody called the music teacher when actually they're just a teacher who happens to play a few guitar chords or they can sing or something. It's like, well, okay, you're it this year and then next year it'll be somebody different. They haven't been given the skills of how to actually teach music itself. So it's a really disappointing thing here in Australia and I know it's the same in some other countries. But it really comes down to things like politics and money, hmm. unfortunately. We really need advocacy. We need parents and students and, you know, everybody in the community to be pushing and pushing and pushing to improve it because otherwise it's just going to stay the same. Yeah. No, you made a really good point that music teachers certainly, um, they might c command a large sum of money at times, but it's important that uh, the consumers keep in mind that yeah you can go with a bargain basement music teacher if you if you so choose and maybe they'll be decent but if you're paying more you're paying for somebody with probably a lot of experience and recording and gigs and other things behind them so it's it's worth absolutely. it absolutely it is it, it's the same old thing you know you pay for for quality you know mm -hmm. well, that that's usually how it works out and if you get quality, you get better results. And, again, it comes back to the simple things of good, experienced, quality music teachers will be able to help students be motivated and continue and get to their goals, whereas inexperienced uh, music teachers are more likely to have that quick turnaround of, of students who just lose interest because they are struggling in some capacity, they can't read music or the teacher doesn't have the skills that fit what they want to do and then they drop out of learning music and that's their only experience of it. It's actually one of the reasons why I ended up writing my own music methodologies because I saw so many teachers when I first started out who were pushing their students through exam after exam and the students were going, oh, this is so boring. I don't want to do exams. I want to play the latest, latest pop song. I want to be able to, you know, doodle around and make up my own songs and things so that the teachers and the students weren't lining up with the same goals. So I also found a lot of students who were struggling to learn to read music and that was the big catalyst that eventually I spent years and I wrote all my own music teaching books 
uh, which go across six different instruments, and they break down how to learn to read music in a really simple way by just doing one little concept at a time such that preschoolers can learn to read music quite easily. Uh, and it makes such a difference if things are easy for people. They keep going if it's easy. If it's hard, then why would they keep going with something if it's a struggle? Hmm. That's awesome. And I mean, that's an opportunity all its own. And on that note too, you recently completed a book titled Music Teaching Made Profitable. I understand that this book is going to be launched in late August, which is likely when this podcast episode will go live. It takes something to put together a book and it's obviously because you have something to say. So what's the message you wanted to share with the world? Well, I've actually got an advanced copy here I can oh. show you. Can you see that, David? <laughs> yeah, I do see it. That's fantastic. Yeah, so it's a real book. Look. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, look, the, the title sort of says it all, Music Teaching Made Profitable, uh, because I've had so many conversations with teachers over the years about the fact that they love teaching, they might be really good at it, but they struggle with the irregular income and mm. it comes down to that that thing we talked about before that they don't have the business skills so the structure of the book takes them through three different systems that I've developed myself over the years that have, have been put in place as I learned how to run a business so there's things like the the basic evolution of a business so when you're, you're in that mode of starting up a business, you have to do a lot of planning. You have to make designs and decide where you're going to put your money. So there's eventually, essentially seven different phases of developing a business from that first idea of dreaming it up and designing it and building it, testing it and tweaking it and sharing it with your community and expanding it so forth. So I take people through what these different phases are so they know the steps to take them through. And the fact that it's never really done because it's a cycle. You, you can constantly reinvent your music school, your business, and keep developing it. You need to, to keep it fresh. Then there's the system what I call the music school success ladder. And it's a bit like what I was describing before where you might start out as a musician um, and you want to get into teaching, so you go and teach for somebody else, and then you decide to teach yourself, and then you decide to take on teachers, and then you decide to go into another location, and then you decide to do less teaching and direct, and so on and so forth. So there's this growth ladder. So the success ladder is essentially outlining all those different types of, of business structures and different sizes of business that you can work through so that you can design the right sort of music studio for yourself. So the third structure then is all of the business systems that you need to make all of these things happen. So I've uh, put it into eight different areas. So you've got finance, you've got IP, you've got the legals, you've got the merchandise, you've got the operations, you've got the HR, you've got the IT and you've got the marketing. Now without all eight of those operating, your business is not going to be quite on an even keel. If something drops off entirely, then you're going to find you'll have problems. Like if you don't look after your legal department or you don't look after your financial area, then obviously things are, are going to fall uh, apart and you're going to end up with some major problems. The same with every other area. If you don't look after your HR, you don't look after your teachers or you don't look after you know, your own education, then things will, will become a struggle at some point. So knowing about all of the different parts of your business, knowing how to develop it and knowing what to watch out for can save you so much grief, so much money, so much time. So the whole point of this book is to educate people about these sorts of things so that they, they can then figure out where they need some help, what they need to learn about in more depth, and they can go forward from there. I love how you've broken it all down, so I'm definitely looking forward to checking that out. Now, 
as an author of four books myself, when I'm talking to another author, I always like to get uh, a sense of their motivation for their writing, especially knowing how involved the process can be. So why did you decide to write a book? Well, I've been approached by quite a few teachers over the last, probably last five years. And it's it comes down to things like how much time do I have to spend with each person and how much time do they have and how much money do they have and by putting it all to all these ideas into one book you know it costs people $29 um, to buy a book and it's just jam-packed with all of this information there's like 144 pages worth I think Um, so it's a very affordable way for people to educate themselves and for me it was also really nice to be able to put all of this knowledge just in one place instead of, you know, having it all just stuck in my head or having it, you know, in various videos and webinars and little bits and pieces. So consolidating everything together was really important for me as well as making it an easy way for people to get access. Absolutely. I agree with you. You know, books and courses are probably amongst the best value that uh, that's out there. Some of the best money spent because you can download people's thoughts and strategies and tactics and ideas directly uh, from the source, which is fantastic. What would you say are some of the greatest challenges you've encountered as a music entrepreneur? Look, I think the biggest challenge is probably what I call the human factor. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and again, maybe this might shock people, but maybe not. Um, dealing with other people, you know, nobody else is ever the same as you. So being able to communicate really effectively and technology sometimes is our greatest enemy as well as our greatest blessing. Sure. You know, you can send emails to people and they can be misunderstood if you don't, you know, be mindful of how you word things. Text messages can be the same. So uh, you've got to be careful about how you communicate, when you communicate, and and people like to communicate in different ways. Uh, some people are on their devices all day, every day, and they don't mind when you send messages. Other people you know, you have to be respectful and send them less communication. Uh, Some people need more help to learn how to do things. Some people need less. So managing people in a respectful way, in a way that works for them, works for you. And that, that goes for students and parents and teachers and employees and, you know, even suppliers and anybody in your network. Um, so getting the balance right, dealing with other people, I think is the hardest part. I could see that for sure. What are some of the victories you've experienced as a music entrepreneur? Victories. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, look, teaching itself has lots of mini victories. You know, when you get students who, who have breakthrough moments, um, that's certainly a victory on a teaching level. As an entrepreneur, um, I think things like creating your own courses, uh, for me, when I got my method books written, that was one thing and I started to use them and find that they worked for me. And then I had other teachers start to use them and they worked for them. I mean, that's that's huge when you can say, somebody says to you, look, these books really work, they really make it easy for these students to learn how to read music. I mean, that that makes you feel pretty good. Uh, and similarly, when your music sp- school grows and you get feedback from parents and students and teachers about how wonderful the latest concert was or you know how much they're enjoying learning and the impact it's having on them or their family <clears throat> or their community, you know, um, the impact that, that is being spread just because of what you're doing, all of those things that I see as victories. So... You know, it's not just about your income or or your material possessions. It's it's that wider impact, I think, that is the bigger thing for me. Are there any books or resources that have helped you on your journey? I think there's so many books over the years that I probably can't even remember them all. <laughs> um, there's some Jack Canfield books that I found really good, uh, you know, the success principles and things. Yep. They're really useful. 
Um, strangely enough, things that have had the probably the biggest impact are things like taking up meditation and doing a meditation course. And that came about through a business course that I went to by Kerwin Ray. He did, does some brilliant um, business courses and he was talking about his lifestyle challenges and how he manages things like burnout and so forth, you know, just from a general business perspective. And uh, so we went through some meditation at this business course and it was one of those lifesavers for me that I found that when I had some family traumas, we had a couple of years where we had quite a few members of the family who passed on and we had bushfires and other things. So being able to take up meditation and develop a, a healthy lifestyle was really invaluable. So I think any sort of education, any self-education that you take up, whether it's for knowledge or skills or livestock, it's just invaluable. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time and your generosity, Wendy. Is there anything else I should have asked? Not that I can think of, except maybe what's my favorite color. Oh, what's your favorite color? Red. Uh, <laughs> red is tough. As it's, in my book. <laughs> yeah, it's an attention-catching color for sure. It's passionate color, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. I really appreciate you taking the time today, David. Oh, yeah, it's a pleasure on my part too. Uh, where can people find you online? They can go to wendysmusic.com.au and they'll find that there's sections there for teachers. Uh, they can read more detail about the book and even look at a sample chapter if they wish. Hmm. I'm also on social media on Facebook and so forth all the time too. So Wendy Brentnell or Wendy's Music. All right. Thank you so much. That's a pleasure. Thanks, David. Thanks. You've been hearing whisperings about it. It's the Music Entrepreneur Code. No, I haven't shared a whole lot about what this is just yet. And this is not the time for that either. But I do want to let you know that you can get on the waiting list to find out exactly what it is. We're really excited about this and we know that you're going to get a lot of value out of it. It's the Music Entrepreneur Code. Go to musicentrepreneurhq.com slash code to get on the waiting list. Thank you for listening. Music in this episode was brought to you by Brian Young. Wherever you're listening to this right now, please consider leaving a five-star review and comment to help us get the word out about the podcast. Music.